do you want the pain in the short term or do you want the pain in the longer term? Because the pain mm-hmm. in the short term of saying, I'm a triangle player, not the rest of this stuff, is maybe I'm going to say, you can't have this job because I need more. Right. But if I hire a triangle player and you're the best one, now we have a band. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is Brave New Work, a podcast about reinventing our organizations and the search for a more adaptive and human way of working. I'm Aaron Dignan, and I'm joined by my colorful co-host, Rodney Evans. I used to be so nervous to, like, say hi to everyone, and literally, I was just yawning so hard that I couldn't get to the (laughs) microphone. How relaxed we have become in our late hundreds of episodes. Repetitions really do it for you, don't they? I know, right? Anyway, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. On today's episode, we're going to talk about something really timely, which is interviewing for a new job. But before we get into that, let's interview each other for the check-in. Can't wait. Okay. We will start our episode with a check-in round. Uh, I just learned from someone today that he does check-in rounds at the beginning of every meeting, thanks to Sam Sperlin, not thanks to us. So congratulations, (laughs) Sam. Friend of the show. Uh, (laughs) Anyway, our check-in question for today is, how does color shape, influence, or impact your life? I think you should start, Morticia. Hey, stop. Hey. Uh, Unkind. Just joke. I, first of all, Mm-hmm. Britt has taken it on herself to introduce some color into my wardrobe. So there's some maroon, there's some navy blue, there's some brown. We're going jewel tones. There are, there are things like ha- exactly. That's as far as I can go. There I are things it. happening. But here's the deal. I don't really care much about the color on me because I don't see me. You all have to look at me. Mm-hmm. I am hugely interested in color outside of me, though. And mm-hmm. I would say, generally speaking, in my life, the colors I like around me, like where I live are pretty muted, pretty understated. Like I have definitely have a bit of a haunted house vibe over here. But then when I go out in the world, I love like vibrant colors. I love modern colors. I love like hummingbirds and starlings and sea foam and like anything that has a lot of richness to it, because that, that brightness awakens feelings in me of being like very joyful and very optimistic. But then for some reason, when I come home, I'm like, let's keep it gold, black, brown, wood, (laughs) whatever. So I don't know what my, I don't know how to describe it, but I guess I have a very like unbalanced relationship with color where in some parts of my life, I want it to be wild and neon. And then in other parts, it's like very understated. And that's it for me. I feel like that brown sweater was a real gateway drug. It was a real gateway drug (laughs) and it's still prominently hung up there, ready to rock at any time. It's such a good sweater. I told you when we were in Portland that I was like, I don't I don't want to cause offense, but I think you might look better in brown than black. I'm not offended at all. And for the listeners who didn't catch that, I, I did a speech in Maine and I decided to cosplay being in Maine. And so it was like chukas, brown sweater, et cetera. Very unusual you dressed for like me. like a leaf. It was yeah. great. Uh-huh. It was wonderful. <laughs> I love color. I love it. I said once on a very, very early episode of this podcast that walking through my closet is just like a fraggle rock. It's like problematic because everything has a pattern. And so when all of both your tops and bottoms have patterns, they don't go together. (laughs) And um, hilariously, like right now I am wearing green pants and a red shirt and literally a rainbow sweater. (laughs) Um, I need to have a lot of color. I'm not like a huge fan of neutrals in any context. And I feel very sensitive to color. So like, uh, because I love design and I love home design, I'm like, I am one of those people who will try 20 different navy paint swatches before I pick the right navy. And when it's wrong, and I have definitely gotten it wrong, I can't like I can't live like I, I painted most of this house this gray color. And, and like within a year I was like, Oh, I hate it. I hate it so much that it was like all I could see. And I was just obsessed with it. And then we had to change the gray paint. So I would say it has an outsized impact on my mood. I'm just generally visual. And so I don't like looking at colors that don't make me happy. And I go through phases where there'll be like a palette and that palette is like our living room and my closet and what is in paintings I make. I'm like, this is what I'm doing right now. And then the whole palette will change 
like every couple of years. And I'll be like, I hate that now. So I don't know. It's a big deal. Color is a big deal. That is awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's so, we're so different in that way, but we both appreciate design and color. We do. So I don't know. I, I learned recently that I think I've mentioned this on the show at least once before. We see color differently because the cones in our yeah. eyes are activated by different colors in different ways. And so there are like three kinds of cone cells and you have different distributions of them and yada, yada, yada. Punchline is your like 40 review of, of the Navy's would be different mm. for me. Um, yes. And so Britt and I have decided that there are people that are like more reliable color judges. Oh, and, interesting. And you can just be like, you know, they're like more average, I guess, or more like centrally rooted. So you can be like this person you want to ask about color, this person, not so much. Ed would tell you that I am the latter because he uh-huh. believes that he sees it correctly and that I don't. The master of all color. Yeah, we argue about this a lot. And incidentally, (laughs) here's what a funny thing is. I find being in spaces that are very neutral or monochromatic, like very relaxing and very beautiful. But Mm -hmm. I just like, you know, it's just a funny thing. It's funny. When I go into a hotel room that's like all shades of white, I'm like, why don't I live like this? (laughs) And then I come home and I'm like, no, (laughs) let the Skittles out. You know, I don't know. It's just weird. It's just weird. That's great. So our topic for today is interviewing, interviewing for jobs. Uh, This has really been on my mind a lot lately for a variety of reasons. And I'm going to ask you first why you wanted to talk about it because you were also excited to talk about this today. Yes, I'm jazzed to talk about this because number one, it affects a ton of people. So like most of you listening out there have a job and will interview for other jobs in the future. So I love doing things that that have broad appeal And it feels like a really auspicious moment to talk about interviewing because a lot of people are being laid off right now. A lot of people are worried about that. A lot of people are looking maybe for different or greener pastures because of the behavior of their corporate overlords. There's we're sort of coming out of great resignation territory. And after the quiet quitting conversation, I just sense a lot of energy around like either I need to interview for a new job or I want to interview for a new job. And when I do it, I want to be mindful of some of the types of things that Aaron and Rodney talk about on the show. Yeah. So that that's why I'm I'm psyched about it. Cool. And also, I want to talk also, which I don't know if we've planned for, but do it anyway. Um, (laughs) Like it's it's so borked the way interviewing happens in companies, and like I have friends who are going through interview processes now, and when they describe it to me, I'm just like, run, run from that place. It's just, it's, it's a mess. It's just a mess out there. It's, I mean, interviewing and dating kind of go together in terms of what a hot mess they are, and I find that generally speaking, in both camps, most of the people who give a positive review are just giving a positive review because they got the job (laughs) of you know, whatever VP or boyfriend. And most people who are mad are mad because they didn't get the job. But it's so it's really hard to get an objective review of like, is it a good experience? You know, is it well done? And the other thing I feel like really those two experiences have in common is the old like, how you do something how is how you do everything. I believe it was a Buddhist adage, where I always feel like what someone really is like And what the company really is like is being telegraphed in the first interview if you're paying attention. Mm. And later, like in dates like, you know, three through 10, everybody has figured out what everybody else wants. And now we're all like, you know, (laughs) masquerading as like the version that they want. And but then the first interaction version comes back. Yeah. And I think about this all the time, like when I can think of so many people I've hired that later down the road stuff came out and I was like I said this was going to be in our first fucking interview and then I like talked myself out of it because of all of these other things so anyway there's just a funny like first blush signaling that happens I think in both of those contexts I mean it's the whole Malcolm Gladwell blink thing which is like we have weird (laughs) we have weird oh come on Um, I I tried so hard (laughs) But I mean, but you got you got the gist, right? I mean, I get I get it. Yeah, it's an ironic book to get a taste of and then put down. You're like, I got it. It's more it or less. Wasn't for you know, me. I got a feel <laughs> for it. But yeah, I think that's true. I think there's a lot of information that we pick up on intuitively in in these early sessions in both directions. 
And so I think we should talk about it. And I, I think my goal for the conversation is to give people information and tools about how to have a better experience, even if the experience they're going into isn't well designed. Okay. My goal is to give people designing interviews some tips for how to make it less shitty. Oh my God. If we put the two together, <laughs> it's ah, the ultimate magic. interviewing episode. It's like we're org designers. <laughs> Look at them go. <laughs> so I guess I want to ask you when the last time you were interviewed was. 90 minutes ago. Really? Yeah. What was it like? It was super nerve wracking. I, you, so you know about this, but it finally happened. I was interviewing for, uh, I mean, interview is a strong word, but it was for a job being a tarot reader. Right, right. And before that interview, but this is part of why I wanted to do this episode because before that interview, my last interview for a job was in 2004. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's and then I haven't ago. interviewed for a job since then. So, right. you know, I'm a little rusty and it was, I mean, obviously this was not like interviewing for like a COO job, but right. it was still like, I thought about what I was going to wear and then I went to a place and then I met a person <laughs> and then they judged me <laughs> right, and I was right, nervous right. about it. And so I was right. just like, holy shit, this is what, this is what this is like. I forgot mm. what this is like. It's a real psychological thing. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a thing. So anyway, it's I have some recency bias around this one because that just happened. But before then, it was almost 20 years ago. Huh, okay. And you, sir? Interesting. I mean, in the professional setting, never. <laughs> but, but, but I certainly interviewed for like my job at the bagel place. Sure. When you, you know. were a grocery checker? Yeah, order. I interviewed for my grocery job. All definitely did, did yeah. those things for real. I think, I, I'll tell you what ran through my head when when you put this question down and and it was kind of a little bit of a wrestling match in my head where I was like, well, I haven't been interviewed for a job really like a real professional job ever. So I don't know what I'm talking about, but then is it all sales interviewing? And in a way, like you're, you're trying to sell yourself, right? So every sales conversation you have is a kind of an interview. But then the other part of me was like, but wait a second, Do you want to misrepresent yourself or represent yourself in some kind of a best light in an interview? Or do you actually want to be more real? And then I was like, well, wait a second. How much of sales is real versus representing yourself in a certain way? So I went through this whole loop. What a journey you went on. Yeah, it was a big journey. But where I've come down on it is that, no, I haven't been interviewed in a long time. (laughs) The TLDR is don't ask this guy to interview for a job because he doesn't know how. Um, Mm -mm. I feel like the internal voyage that you took is what's wrong with yeah. interviewing. Yeah, Is totally. that the incentives are misaligned the same way that the incentives are often misaligned in sales, where it's like yeah. the, the thrill of the kill is what drives you. And then you're just like, ugh, I don't want to eat this. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Gross. Antelope, yeah. you know? And, I, and it's a real... It's a real problem, I think. I find that I do. it took me so many years to finally be like, when I was on my own, to finally be like, I need to pick my clients. What right. the fuck am I doing? Because in the moment, I would just be like, you know. How do I make you love just me? Just be in a fugue state where I was like, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. And then I would get it. And I'd be like, I hate these people so much. What right. am I doing right. here? Yeah, it took that took like, you know, five years of deprogramming probably. I totally get that. And I think it is, it's an important place to start maybe in our conversation about how to be an interviewee, how to go interview in Mm. a way that's useful to you, which is like you, it's certainly okay to put a good foot forward and to be a self-advocate and to talk about what makes you great and what you want. But I think trying to make it happen is probably a negative pattern. Like you don't want to force it. And I think with so much of, uh, of these kind of interview settings, sales settings, you are listening to what they want. And you certainly like I could go to an interview and be like, oh, yes, I'm very reliable. Mm -hmm. And then they would be like, great, that's what we want. And then I would get there and they'd be like, you're a mad scientist. You're not what you described. And then we have tension. Now we have an issue. And so I think you don't I think you really do want to avoid that kind of overselling. And, And the littlest example of this is always the like, what's your weakness? And people are like, I work too hard. And they're like, Mm -hmm. what's your, you know, tell me about a time when, and they're like, well, the time that I was working at NASA, like everything is always the grandest, most perfect version of everything instead of keeping it real. So do you think it's possible to interview authentically and still get the job? 
Fun, quick story. I did once interview for an internship that I really wanted and then did ultimately get. And when they asked me what my weakness was, I said, I can be really mean. (laughs) (laughs) Because I just didn't know better. It was the first time I had ever interviewed for like a corporate job. I had only ever been a camp counselor before and like a babysitter and like a cello teacher. And so I didn't know that you were supposed to say like, "Mm, I'm just really hard on myself. I was just like, I can be mean. (laughs) That's it. And they were like, okay. I kind of think it's varsity though. (laughs) Yeah. Like that's intentionally. That's beginner's mind, you know? (laughs) I just didn't I didn't know what you were supposed to say. Anyway, they hired me and I was there for four summers and it was a really great experience. But And they were uh, like, you know what? She is mean. (laughs) (laughs) It was actually really nice there. Everybody was really lovely. So (laughs) they're like, what happened? I had to lift because of (laughs) how kind everyone was to me. Or maybe they were just constantly afraid from that moment forward. Could be. Maybe I just primed them to be super nice. Because They're like, they this is Rodney. She's going to be on the desk next to you. By the way, she's really mean. <laughs> Watch out. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Probably. That's probably true. Anyway, wait, where were we? Oh, contorting yourself. Yes. Yeah. I remember having a conversation with one of my friends who was interviewing at a very large company that is a former client of yours, not mine. And... She was describing the interview process to me and what the job was. And she was explaining to me in excruciating detail all of the ways in which she was basically going to change her entire personality and work style oh, for, this, for this job because of like yeah. what it could do for her and what it was going to pay and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, are you listening to yourself? Because you're basically creating a person that you're going to LARP at mm-hmm. work till you quit or retire. <laughs> like, is that... Are we sure that's the move here? But I think there is something inside of us, particularly depending on like style. And I bet you and I both get into trouble with this in different ways. Um, she's a three. She's just like, please accept me. Please love me. I'll be whatever you want. And I'm a seven. And I'm like, there's something in here to get excited about. Yeah. Like there's like, I'm always like looking for the little sparkle of thing that I can connect to. And then I'm like, oh, cool. That was... of this overall experience. What am I doing here? So I think knowing, knowing like your own tendencies around this stuff can help you not just sell yourself straight into hell. I'm glad that you said the thing about kind of putting on this role that would last the whole time, because I actually think it doesn't stop at the interview. And I think you're right that my assessment of most people I meet in corporate America is that they are wearing a corporate mask that was fashioned for them during an interview somewhere and that they just don't take off. Like this just now I pretend to be serious. Now I pretend to be not funny. Now I pretend to be studious and, and that's just what I am at work. And then when I go yeah. home, I like kick back. So it does feel like it starts a, a negative pattern. What do you think, what do you think are the conditions you can create as an interviewer, as an employer mm. to create the, the best possible scenario in terms of authenticity? Yeah. I mean, I don't know totally, but I guess two things come to mind really quickly. One is being authentic yourself. Like, I think you're just signaling to someone that that is how you are. And so you're inviting them to be that way too. I think I just had an interview with someone for the ready. And something that was cool about it was that it became clear through the conversation that it was not going to be the right arrangement. Sure. And it was like a really good conversation because it wasn't going to be right because of skill sets and experience. And I thought this person was very cool and like very lovely. And like, I would love to work with them sometime. And I like made that clear and they received it really well because it wasn't like, it didn't feel it, the the whole interaction and I don't know how this happened maybe they were just like exceptionally balanced and not grippy about it or maybe they didn't want the job I don't fucking know anyway the whole experience wasn't like it felt like we were both evaluating mm-hmm. a possibility and we both decided that it wasn't the right possibility and we were fans of each other and I think I'll probably talk to that person again and right. I think there was something in that that felt like our job here is for us to both pull back the onion far enough to figure something out, not right. to like judge each other against a hidden agenda. 
Right. No, I'm glad you said that because we've been having this discussion on the murmur side lately about fit and about the idea Mm. of like, the question is not, are you good? The question is, are you learning in this environment? Like, are Mm -hmm. you able to be growing in this environment? It's a plant soil question where it's like, if you take a cactus and you put it in a greenhouse and you bury it in water, it's going to die. And if you put an orchid in a desert, it's going to die. There's nothing wrong with the orchid. There's nothing wrong with the desert. It's just about fit. And so in that way, if you're like, oh, wait a second, this role isn't the right role for you, but you're dope. Yeah. That's not a fail on anyone's part. And if, and I think like discovering that together, if you can do that, if you can hold it that lightly is pretty cool. Yeah. And I, I feel like most people are treating it like a judgment about them as a person and a, and a kind of a, popularity contest when it's actually supposed to be a fit test. Right. Well, I think that's exactly right. Cause then, cause it feels, it feels when you're a candidate, like, I almost <laughs> today was, was like, how many tarot readers are you talking to? But then I was like, yeah, that's, exactly, that yeah. feels so <laughs> fucking thirsty. And where do they down. live? <laughs> are they local or, um, or mm-hmm. at, yeah, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Oh, I got it by the way. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So of course you did. The I'm important outcome of the story, but in one of the ways that that happened in this particular interview in this interaction was me as in this role, quote unquote, like the hiring manager, even though that's not how it works at the ready. Like I, I'm really clear on what I need, which is mostly based on what I don't know how to do. Right. And so in this interaction, I was kind of like, you seem great. I need this because I, of how bad I am at this. And she was like, no, that's not me. I don't do that. I yeah. can do this stuff, but it sounds to me like what you're looking for is X. And I was like, yes, that is what I'm looking for. And she was like, well, I'm sorry that that's not me. And then we had this whole other conversation that was super, super interesting. So that I don't know, feels, there's like some some clarity in there that is interesting when it happens. That feels like high maturity on both sides of the equation though, which I think is critical because the early career person who just needs work might be like, oh, I can do whatever you want me to do. Sure. Right. And they might say, oh, I'll do that and not know that they're not going to like it. And as, and someone yeah. who's a little bit more experienced is like, A, I don't know how to do that. And B, I don't want to know how to do that. Like what sure. I do is this. I play basketball. Yeah. I don't play baseball. And I think that, that it takes a little bit of, you know, fits and starts and, ex- and experience in your career to get to the point where you can show up like that. But it's awfully nice when you can. And the most really is. (laughs) And that just brought up one thing for me that I want to say before it's gone, which is like, it's so the most frustrating experiences that I've had in hiring are when someone is like, I can do all of these. I'm a one year band. And they're like, I can play the drums and the tambourine. Watch me sing and I play the harmonica. And I'm like, oh my God, that's so great because we really need all of that and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, actually, I play the triangle and I find that out six months later and I'm so fucking mad Yes, because I'm like, if you had told me you were a triangle player, I would have hired you to play the triangle and then I would have hired a bunch of other musicians, but you lied to me and now look at the mess we've made. So it's like that clarity. It's like, do you want the pain in the short term or do you want the pain in the longer term? Because the pain Mm -hmm. in the short term of saying I'm a triangle player not the rest of this stuff is maybe I'm going to say you you can't have this job because I need more. Right. But if I hire a triangle player and you're the best one, then w- now, now we're working. Now we have a band that's going to play because so we're going to fill it out. To me, this is becoming like a one B of my advice for interviewers. So the one was about oh, authenticity. The B, the one, one a, I guess one a of this is like, you want to represent yourself, especially in early career, for what you can actually follow through on. And yeah. I, I understand and I know the struggle of the early career interviewer who is like, I don't have a lot of skills. I don't have a lot of experience. So I have to front. Yeah. And I think yeah. what you actually need to do is dial into like, what does someone look for in an early career player? And that's mm-hmm. where I'd rather hear about like, I love to learn. I am intense. I am willing to do this or willing to do that. I have had these experiences that I think might inform my ability to learn the job, et cetera. But like speaking about the things that you actually have instead of things that you might get, 
Because if somebody comes in and they're like, look, I, I eat learning opportunities for breakfast. And if you give me six months, I will consume everything you put before me. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do my best and I'm reliable and I keep my commitments. I'm going to be like, that sounds pretty good if we have a spot sure. for that. You know, sure. but if you come in and you're like, yeah, I play all the instruments and you really play the triangle, then you're just setting yourself up to look like an idiot in a few yeah. months. And then it's like, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And then there's also like, yeah, then then you've also like you've cost someone else a bunch of opportunities. Yes. Or a bunch of people opportunities. And you've cost the team a lot of time in figuring out all of the jobs that you're not going to do, which yes. is not great for the relationship <laughs> generally. Right. right. I, you know what the thing that you were saying about the early career thing brought up for me? I'm curious your take on this. I probably people are going to get mad when I say this. So <laughs> go ahead, go ahead and email me. Hate mail. Um, can't wait. I want to see when people are not very experienced in their career I want to see, I like really want to see the learning orientation. I love it when people have an understanding of how they learn and what they want to learn. That's like very exciting to me. And the more experience someone has, like the more opinionated I want them to be. And the more I want them to be like, Mm -hmm. here is my perspective on this domain that I understand very deeply. I don't really care what you think about it, even though you're in the position of interviewing me because I know better than you. about right. this because that's right. why you're hiring me. Correct. Sometimes I used to hire a lot of people that were very early in their careers. And sometimes those things got mixed together. And people mm. who had very little experience or no experience at all, like did a lot of research so that they could come with really hot takes, mm-hmm. did not always land super well because they did not feel like they were grounded in anything like lived. Right. 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 And yeah, conversely, think, if you're somebody who's like, I'm a 20 year finance professional and you show up to just be like, I just want to like really like learn about whatever. I'm like, <laughs> fuck, that's <laughs> cool. That's not going to probably work because I don't know. And right. there's no one here to teach you. So no, I don't know. There's like something about not because I think, you know, not because I think experienced people should stop learning, but because I don't know, it's just a different, it's a different position in life. Yes. Yes. Well, and this is why. I'm such a fan of the Shuhari concept that we talk about Mm. all the time at the ready and at murmur and sometimes on the show, which is like, it kind of helps you figure out what mode you're supposed to be in depending on where you're at in that experience. So if you're in early, earlier part of your career or even earlier part of your experience with a role, like I I have new roles right right now that I'm learning how to do. You're in the mode of like book writer turns out totally. And it's like, what is the, what are the moves? Like, what do people who know what they're doing do? I'm going to do the moves. And then you go in and you represent that. Like I've done the moves. I've run 20 ad campaigns on Facebook and I kind of know, I know the status quo of like how to do that. Well, that's great. Like I'll take that all day. Then you move up into the ha and it's like, yeah, you know, the way most people do it on Facebook is good, but there's like a couple little hacks that I know about that most people don't. And so we do some algorithmic stuff and we do some like, we've got, we've got a little AI thing that we've used to make it smarter, whatever it is. Like they have moves that are kind of outside of the zone. And then you interview someone who's at the re-level and they're like, oh, Facebook's dead, sweetie. That's not, <laughs> we're not, we're not doing that. We're not even going to do ads the way you think of them. Like we're going to do a yeah. content marketing strategy that's going to like surround the customer And it's going to work this way, which, by the way, I've done at this company, this company, this company, this company, and this company. And this is the one where I reinvented it. And like they're playing a a completely different game of 3D chess. And all of those are fine. Like you don't have to be one of those or the other of those. You just have to represent where you are. And then if people need that that thing, they'll get it. I really like that as a frame. I haven't thought about using that mental model from the candidate perspective. I thought about it a lot from the hiring perspective. (laughs) I know. But I really like the idea of like coming in and sort of repping what your level of mastery is in the various like elements of the job. Totally. And and remembering that most, you know, most knowledge work is multifaceted. And so you might be at a different level of mastery around one part of the domain than another. And that's absolutely fine. But doing this, doing the self assessing before you show up is all always a good call. Yeah. And then you can tell that story, however nuanced it is. And then they can tell you where it fits into their strategy. Cause like there are things in my life where I don't need anything more than just like consistent status quo, get it done action. Yeah. So if somebody comes in and represents that and, and they're interested and they have the right 
principles and value and like we vibe, we're good. I don't need someone to reinvent the way the ready uses Twitter. Like that's mm. not necessarily on my menu right now. So I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to look for that. But there are other areas where I'm like, man, I'd love someone to really tear up the sheet, you know? That's so funny. So, I'm currently reinventing the way the ready does Twitter. Well, great. Maybe you need that. <laughs> Just using it's it funny as an that example. that came up. No, it's funny to hear you say that because while it lasts, I've just not, I've not known you to not be like, who's the unicorn in this? But maybe that's I, just because of the kind of roles that we've hired together. Yeah, could be, could be. I think, especially as I think about product and I think about mm. things that are more consistent at scale. There are places where I'm like, we need to innovate here and other places where I'm like, we just need to know how it's done. I'll give you a perfect example. Right now, we're spending a lot of time and energy thinking about data and analytics, Mm -hmm. customer data. We Mm -hmm. just want to know what they're doing. We want to know why they're doing it. We want to figure out what's going on with customer data. I am not looking for someone to reinvent the industry. (laughs) I'm just looking for someone that's like, here's how the pros do it. Here's how you do this. You know, and like, that's good Uh enough. And we can invent some other stuff together like that's and then maybe we'll get around to it. But like right now, the need is shoe level need. We just Mm -hmm. need to do by the book. Mm -hmm. And so that's all I'm interviewing for essentially in those conversations. And we'll see. Fun. So for the people who are out there listening, who are either looking for a job or should be, what should they be doing? What should they be doing, Aaron, that they're not doing right now? How should they be thinking about interviewing? To me, I think about interviewing the way I think about coaching and consulting, which is like, on the one hand, you are trying to establish yourself as someone that can be trusted and that knows what they're doing. On the Mm -hmm. other hand, your main job is a curiosity job. Like you should be asking questions and the questions reveal your intelligence. The questions reveal how incisive you are. And so to me, sometimes candidates come in and they put on a show about how smart they are but they never mm-hmm. ask any good questions. Mm. And when I asked you have any questions for me, it's kind of like crickets, you know, or they ask mm-hmm. a question that's like really, really low hanging fruit. And I feel like what would be more interesting if I was preparing for an interview would be like, number one, I've done the homework. So if like I've had a look around, I've listened, I've watched, I've read, I've kind of spent some time in their world so that mm. I, I've started to tune in with my expertise, with my pattern recognition to like, what are some of the things that are interesting here? And then I'm coming with a bunch of questions because I need the answers in order to be dangerous. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's about starting the interview like you're starting the job, mm-hmm. which is basically like, I would love someone to just come in and day one be like, so I'm interviewing for this producer job. I've got 20 questions because if we're going to achieve this goal, we're going to need yeah. to know the answers to these things. And they just like totally. start walking the path, like start consulting me in an interesting way. And again, if you're not at that level of mastery, then the questions might be different. They might be about how will I be supported? How fast do other people learn in your environment? What kinds of expectations are there going to be? What does good look like? Those kinds of questions are equally impressive. They're just not as you know re- high and re-level. But the curiosity piece is one that matters a lot to me. The authenticity piece is the other, like you talked about. And I have had some hilarious experiences this year where, as you know, I come in pretty loose in an interview Mm. setting. I'm like definitely down to goof off together, talk about whatever. I try not to be a high pressure interviewer. And yet I've had some people that I literally could not break. Like Mm. I could not crack them could not get them to have a laugh, to have a smile, to relax. Best material? Cuz I mean, I felt like I brought like my solid hour, like my proven stand-up hour. Yeah. And you're not and there was no there was no there kill. there. Yeah, and I just felt like, how "Oh, you're unreachable. You're not going to put it down cuz you've been too hurt before." So that's a thing about I think just tuning in to like how are they showing up and what does that tell you about what they value? And then it's not to say that you'd be inauthentic in matching that, but like if you have that gear, find it. Mm -hmm. So because there's a lot of research about mirroring and how we when we're selling and negotiating, et cetera, how we like use body language and tone and content to match each other when we're going to be in sync. And I do think sometimes people get so nervous or so in their own heads that they forget to notice what gear somebody's in. Yeah. You know? And and that yeah. could be about casualness. It could be about problem solving. It could be about tone. Who knows what it's about? But whatever they're whatever they're doing is going to show you a little bit about what they value. That's interesting. 
What would you answer I also that? just appreciate when people are just like, I'm nervous. And then we can yes. just get that part over with. Totally. Because I've been nervous and we're all human <laughs> of course, beings. And of it's course. like, oh, great. This person's going to disclose. Like that. Yeah. that's a pattern that they're setting up of like, this person's going to tell me what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate it when people are just like, I'm really nervous. I just need to say that. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you great. need anything from me? Yeah, um, totally. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk about one very nitpicky intra interviewing pet peeve that I have that I encourage candidates to think about deep dive please for the love of God (laughs) do when I ask you for an example of Uh something please do not give me like hand wavy vague MBA nonsense Uh. it is so exhausting to me when I ask a question like tell me about a transformation project that you were really proud of and what your role was. Uh And they're like, well, you know, it was a big client and we did a lot of really great work and it was a large project with a lot of stakeholders, really high pressure, big budget, (laughs) a lot of coordination. And I'm like, oh my God, that is not what I asked you. You know, it's like, what I want to hear from you is we were hired to do digital transformation. We couldn't because their org was borked. What we ended up doing was a series of facilitated workshops and executive coaching. Like I want specificity because if you can't be specific, I don't believe that you either did the work yourself or know what the fuck you're talking about. 100%. And if I have to just like dig and dig and dig and dig to be like, and what did you do? Like I have had interviews where I've been like, okay, just we're having a hard time getting there. Tell me what one day on that project was like for, for you. you. Who were you talking to? What kind of <laughs> words were you writing down? Were you attending <laughs> meetings? What was happening in those meetings? Because to your point about like the corporate mask and socialization, people feel, first of all, like they can absolutely get rewarded for just being full of nonsense and hand waving bullshit. And that kind of speak is so like acceptable and rewarded in so many places that it's just like the language that people get accustomed to. Totally. But I just am like, if you can't explain it to me in a way that I can understand it, then you don't understand it. And so this is not going to work. Do you know how when you watch a movie with the subtitles on, sometimes it'll say like ominous music uh-huh. is playing, you know, it gives you like this kind of meta description of what's happening, but it is in no way the feel of what's happening. That is that kind of interview for that me. That is that interview. It's just <laughs> ominous music. And it's you're like, like, right, but what are they talking about? Yeah. You're like, what's the vibe? And they're like, ominous music. And you're like, yeah. but what's happening? It's like drums. Yeah. It's like, that's yeah, not a plot I, or characters. That's, that's not. Yeah. That is not enough. It is um, not enough. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And so usually that's, that that's the evidence that there's no there there, right? It's either it's yeah. either that they've been socialized to talk that way, which is really disturbing, or there's just not like there's no real story there, which is even scarier. Even scarier. And to me, even if there is a story there, if you can't access that story and tell it to me, you can't do the job that I do. Straight up, clients. because how many millions of times a day is someone going to ask you? So what kinds of transformations fail, you know, and you need to be able to like break it down once every day of my life. So that's my intra interview gripe. My macro advice, which one of my friends is listening to this right now and she's going to be like, I heard you shut up is funny. Don't overdo the planning part. I think a lot of people, especially people who are further along in their careers and a lot of people who are just like conscientious think that they are going to find a job because they do a lot of preparation and a lot of research Mm. and a lot of fiddling Mm. with their resume. Nobody reads your resume. Nobody reads a cover letter. Nobody hires people through job sites. I mean, people do, but like, let's be honest. Uh, (laughs) I'm just like, go get a resume that is good enough on one page to give somebody an idea of what you did and where you did it. And then go start talking to people. Go start having meetings with whoever you know that is in some kind of role or organization or world or fucking meetup group that might be able to start to get you closer to the kind of gig that you want. Yes. Because like a lot of other things we talk about on this show, I think a lot of like resume and 
posting, perusal, and that kind of work can make you feel like you're getting closer when you're not actually getting closer. And then the frustration level when there isn't an interview or a job doesn't appear is much higher because you're like, I've been working on this for six months. And it's like, well, you were doing a kind of work, but it wasn't work that was leading not the to right kind. the yeah. outcome. That and this is a for. myth that we persist in culture around work that I think is really fascinating, which is that the buy the book way of getting a job is the way most people get a job. And it's not. It's so not. like, it's not through resumes. It's not through uploading stuff. It's not through cold emails. None of that. Like, yes, do those things get jobs? Absolutely. There are people that get jobs doing all kinds of stuff, standing on the sure. corner with a sign. But the way that most jobs, most jobs that you would want happen is that somebody has an opening and before they even post about it, there are referrals from within the network of people that yep. are good and that are known quantities and they get into conversations with people and it's socially driven. And that's the reality. And nobody that's talks the about that. It, exactly. They want to put you through the paces. And college makes this worse because they actually teach kids and MBAs to do the shit you're talking about. Yeah, they pretend that the machine produces and it yeah. does. it's a lie. That's like the primary move they're taught. And nobody talks to them about how to build a network or how to build a portfolio or how to write an email that's not cold to someone that you were intro to that actually like rises above the level of just give me a job. Yeah. And like, how much more interesting would it be to be taught? I mean, I think some MBA programs do a good job on the networking front because that's what you spend a quarter of a million dollars to get is access to a network. <laughs> yeah. I think they do a good job in terms of like the introductions and having, you know, access right. to people. But it's like, are people taught in school, particularly in high school or undergrad? Like, okay, so you're in the meet, like you got the informational interview or like the informal coffee or the whatever networking conversation. Is anybody taught what to do in that conversation? Mm -mm. Because a lot of times when I'm asked to have that conversation, people like want to know about my career path and oh my God, please, please kill me. I don't mm -mm. just like read my LinkedIn. That was it. That's, yep. that's how we got there here. And then ask me what you want to ask me. Like, ask me about yourself. Be like, I don't know what I want to do. Here's what I like. What do you think? Or... Mm -hmm. I listen to your podcast and it seems like what you do is cool. What's it like? Like ask me something so we can have an interesting conversation. To your point, I don't feel like people are prepared. They're not taught to network in any kind of effective way. And then even when they stumble into the meetings, they're not prepared to have a conversation that's really going to help them. Yes, totally. And I'm glad you brought up that question because that question is the most popular question of the young aspiring job seeker, which is like, <sighs> how did you get here? What is your secret? Did you want to sing Nobody's Supposed to Be Here as soon as you said that? <laughs> Do you remember that? Maybe. Song? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, carry on. Um, it's the equivalent of walking up to someone that just won the world poker championship and being like, how'd you win? <laughs> the, the answer is like, a lot of stuff. I mean, I don't know a lot where to of start. Happened. Right. Yeah. Like the answer is the first thing I did is I practiced a lot of poker. Yeah. And usually that's the part where, where you kind of lose people is you're like, oh, you want to be X. You want to be a writer? How many pages did you write this month? You yeah. want to be a dancer? How many hours did you sit on the bar? You want to be a lawyer? Like what, how many cases have you tried? What are you doing to get the reps that you need? Because the mm -hmm. reps are the key. And I think so many people are looking for a shortcut because we live in a Kardashianified society where it's like, there's got to be a way to just become an influencer in this area. And the mm -hmm. answer is like, other than people that are just known for how they look, and even that takes work. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's reps there. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do my makeup in like a baked look. I don't know. There's lots of little tricks, tricks of the trade. So I just think the answer is like your job is to get reps. If you don't have reps, your questions are about how to get them yeah, and, and where to get them and like willingness to do whatever it takes to get them. Mm -hmm. And then once you have reps, you can do all the other stuff that you've been talking about, which is like mm -hmm. the way you show up, the way you ask questions, the way you engage with the conversation comes from experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. What about the other side of this? What about the like designing? Because we've talked about hiring process on the show before, but we mm -hmm. haven't necessarily talked about being an interviewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we could talk about this forever, but I will try to be brief because I want to also hear your takes on this. 
I feel very, very convicted about interviews being as much of a simulation of what our working relationship is going to be like as is humanly possible. Strong plus one. We're hiring right now for a finance steward. Please, you all, please send your friends. It's going to be such a fun job to be a finance steward at the ready. It's on our website. The application process is dope. I don't think I've plugged it here, but I probably have. Anyway, send send candidates. And the interview with me for that role, like I send candidates a bunch of our financial data. And then I'm basically like... (laughs) Tell me about this. Tell me about this. (laughs) And tell me what two experiments are that if you were in this role, you would want to run in the first six months. Now, am I looking for perfect content of those experiments? No, I am not. Am I looking for an orientation to data-informed hypothesis making? Yes, I am. And when I'm looking for their insights, mostly what I'm looking for is how good are you At looking at something that's incomplete, which financial data almost always will be, making sense of it and telling someone who doesn't do that for a living what is important about it. So I'm looking for your skills in like financial literacy, storytelling in terms of my user experience with you and your ability to suss out based on what you see, what we might try. And that's going to be the job, at least with me for as long as we're in these roles. So (laughs) I'm just like, let's have our first experience of how that goes because that's what this is going to be like for a long time, probably. Straight up. So yeah, I don't want to hear about your background. I don't care what job you have. I don't really care what job you want. I'm like, let's just talk. (laughs) Let's just do this piece of work together and see if it feels like this is the work we want to do together a lot because that's what's going to happen next. So simulations to me are the number one thing. And within those, I try really, really hard because of how much training I've had around bias in hiring and in Jedi work more broadly. I have a rubric that I am scoring against that is very skills-based. I do try to the best of my ability, though I'm a human, to not be particularly focused on the vibe. Because it's like, we're not interviewing to hang out, we're interviewing to do this thing. And really what I need to know is, can you do this thing? And Mm -hmm. I mean, unless someone is just like a monster, which I've truly (laughs) so rarely interviewed someone that I was just like, we couldn't get along. Um, I really try to not think about my own preferences and who would be fun for me. Cause that's really easy. Of course I want to like hire more buddies, but ultimately that doesn't get us far and it's not very Jedi conscious. Sure. Sure. Yeah, I think there's Those like a, a way to there's a way to reframe that. Maybe I like your main things. I think I have similar main things. First Tell of all, about your main things. Cannot agree more on the simulation aspect. Like the job of the interview is to figure out the answers to these questions, and you're not going to figure that out by just talking. Yeah, <laughs> like it's so weird, right? It would be like again back to the dating thing. It'd be like, what would it be like to kiss you? Let's talk <laughs> about it. You know what I mean? Let's talk and see. What do you think? You know? So I just think it's dumb. Totally. So so I think there are four things I'm looking for in an interview that I'm trying to figure out through getting as close to the work as possible. The first, like you said, is do you know your shit? Do you know your shit? (laughs) You can sort of get there from career history, but not entirely. No. And so you you really need to get under the hood. And that's because other companies are run terribly. Um, the, the second thing is, do you keep your commitments generally? So like, are Mm. you somewhat reliable? Obviously in different jobs and different roles, there are more or less strict criteria around that. If you're our tax person, you need to be like way better than me at that. If you're Mm -hmm. our brand designer, you can probably be a little bit more creative and a little bit harder to pin down because it's part of the skill set. So there's some reading of like, how do you and commitments hang out together? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, The third thing is it's a modification of what you said about trying to avoid the like, are you fun question? But it's something of like, uh, would it be interesting to work with you for a long period of time? Because it's sort of like the airport test gone rogue where it's like, I am going to be around you a lot. And so I don't need Mm -hmm. to like love you. I don't need to think that you're super fun, but I do need to feel some texture where I'm like, hmm, there's something here that could be Mm -hmm. interesting over time. This is not someone that I'm going to, 
tire of quickly. And then that's going to ruin my ability to engage in the work. Yeah. And that's hard. And don't you think that also kind of varies by role? Totally. Because it's like, as you said, even though I know I'm totally talking out of both sides of my mouth, because I just said like, <laughs> you know, that's fucked up. Don't do that. And I love most people over time. So mostly. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's okay. It becomes a non-issue. Mostly I'm trying to get past the like snap judgment you're not my people sure. so that we have enough time to figure out if we are each other's people. But I do think that there are situations where you can't figure that out in the first interview, full stop. And right. you have to have a way to figure that out in the longer term, because it's like, you probably shouldn't be podcast hosts with someone that you don't get along with. Well, you know, when I did projects as a duo member, part of the reason that I like made Allie work with me so much Right. And also begged her to come to the ready is because she's one of my favorite people on earth and long term client transformation work can be a real fucking slog. And yeah, exactly. the most You're fun the part of it for me was being with Allie. Of and course. so I was like, you know, on my on my darkest days doing client work, I still got to be with Allie. And so yes. that was like a very important thing. And that's not the case in every job. Like, I don't no, need to feel that way about everyone. But there are certain places where like a level of trust and safety and love might be a really big difference in performance and then other yeah. places where it's not. And I don't know how to parse those, but it's just a thing that came up as you were talking about that. I think you're right. No, that's that that makes a lot of sense. And there's like degrees on that one as well. And then I guess the last one is something along the lines of like, do you share enough purpose alignment and enough principle alignment that I think you mm. can be successful in this environment? Because ultimately, if you're like, I don't know if that purpose is important, I just don't think you're going to do well in a setting. So I think there has to be some some tuning into like, to your point about the alley scenario, you're going to be pursuing something in building this business, working on this business, working in this business for years. Mm -hmm. um, so there has to be some alignment with the core conditions under which it's operating. And otherwise, I think yeah. it can be dangerous. So for us, for example, like if you think self-management is a terrible idea. Yeah. Probably not for I you. Make this podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so you have to be ma a match on that front, too. So those are the four things that I'm usually looking for. And the best way to find them, to your point, is to try to do actual work because that's where they come out. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm curious how you get at the principles one like you're much more purpose oriented than I am in life generally and so I think it's not a thing that I have focused on much in terms of selecting mm. partners in working contexts and so I'm curious how you get at that because like I can't think of a time that I've really asked questions about <laughs> that stuff I don't know I probably should but yeah I'm curious I mean, I think the easiest one for me is why here. Mm. So mm -hmm. just a brief discussion about like, you could work at any consultancy, you want to work at the ready, why? Like really why? Yeah. yeah. You know, because they are choosing you. And so I think that can be interesting. If somebody's mm -hmm. like, I want to work at Allbirds because I think shoes are cool versus mm -hmm. like, I want to work at Allbirds because I'm a huge climate advocate and I want to turn the way we use carbon in manufacturing on its head, like those are two very different resonances with, mm -hmm. with what they're doing. And the okay. other person would probably be happier at Adidas, mm. you know? Yeah, that's interesting. So it's not a hard, fast thing for me, but I just want to like scratch it a little bit. And it's easier. That's probably the easiest thing to scratch in a conversation because it's hard to fake. Like yeah. I can smell a fake self-management advocate from a mile away. Hmm. So the other stuff is much harder in, without getting into the work. Yeah. That's interesting. That makes sense. The thing I've noticed that I'm curious if you've had this experience too, particularly around self-management, I have found not an insignificant number of people who talk a really good game around the principles and purpose and are full of shit in terms yeah. of their ability to actually work in a self-managed system You're or right. be You're right. good colleagues in a self-managed system. So I'm like curious if you've noticed that too. And I and it always fascinates me because I'm like, who hurt you that you have aligned yourself with mm -hmm. this entire belief system that you cannot get with in practice at <laughs> all? Yeah, it's like fanboying 
a thing where you kind yeah. of are interested in it, but you can't do it. And I just saw this movie in the theater that was extraordinary called The Menu. Highly recommend. And in it, there's a character who is very obsessed with food, with oat cuisine and knows everything and can taste every flavor and uses all the right words and knows all the names of all the contraptions. And then spoiler alert, don't listen to this if you are going to go see the movie. Um, <laughs> He I is am. asked, he's do? asked by the chef at this really fine restaurant to go into the kitchen and cook something for everyone. Uh -huh. And it's just a fucking train wreck. Like it's a right. total disaster because right. he doesn't actually know how to cook because knowing is not doing. Yes. I think part of how you get at that potential dissonance or gap between what I purport to believe and how I actually behave is And this can be a little risky because, again, we don't want to just become judgmental buttheads in an interviewing process, but I pay a lot of attention. And when I was stewarding the hiring circle, really encouraged other members who were in other parts of the process to feed this, this data back, not data about performance inside of the interview, but data about how people behaved around the process. Because what I found is in our worst hires at the ready there was signaling during the process that they were really uncomfortable with the process itself, that they were not comfortable way finding their way through the process, being self-serve in terms of the materials that they had to consume, showing up and really doing rather than talking about. And that showed up usually around the process. And I was like, pay attention to what people are doing when they're not in the interview, but they're between it. That's cool. I like that a lot. In general, I like all these little oblique strategies where it's like, what's happening in the meta? Yeah. Around the interview. Like if they're blowing up Sarah about scheduling the next interview and Sarah gave them the link to schedule the interview, they cannot yeah, work here. Clue. That's a clue Close right there. That's yeah. not, it's Thanks, a no though. from me. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. But like little things like that, again, in the like how someone does something is how they do everything. They yes. are telling you exactly who they are mm -hmm. in those moments. And our candidate experience is designed to self-manage through yes. it. And if you lose your shit trying to self-manage then, you are going to Guess hate what? it at the ready so, so much. <laughs> Which I guess maybe is a good point to end on, at least for this part one of this area. I think we could easily do a second for pass sure. of this. Is design the process to mimic the experience that you'll be having as much as possible. So yeah. if the process of interviewing and the conversation and the tasks and the steps are doing a good job, it should be a signal of like, this is roughly what we're all about. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's accidentally true in a not good way. <laughs> like not, yeah. you know, it's really what you're going to get, but it's not a great thing. But if you are proud of your culture or you are proud of your way of working and you want to make it apparent in the process, I think that's a cool goal. Great. Everybody do that. Do that. Do that thing. Let us know, folks, what questions you have about interviewing or about being an interviewee. I think we could we could dip back into this and sort of see what are the things people really want to know about and, and go a bit further. I also want to hear like really bad interview stories. I yeah, love, we could do. I mean, I love them the way that I love bad dating stories. Right. Maybe we'll now do a little medley fun. episode where we just have like some, some call in <laughs> fail stories. Great. That would yeah. be great. All right. If you liked what you heard today, please do leave us a review. Five stars on all the places. We love it. We read them. It means so, so much to us. Give us the holiday gift that you meant to with a review. <laughs> this show is our interview. Would you hire us? Uh, a <laughs> and quick tip like, of the hat. No. To, <laughs> nope. Sorry. Uh, tip of the hat to Taylor Marvin for making us sound good today. Brave New Work is produced by The Ready, where we help organizations around the world change the way they work and interview. You can get in touch with us by emailing podcast at the ready.com. And as for you, thanks for listening. Now go change something. <laughs>